In this lecture, we'll take a look at how the U.S. does not lose the War of 1812. There are several major events that happened during the War of 1812, and one of them is going to be the bombing of Fort McHenry, which you see here. Fort McHenry is in Baltimore, and the bombing of Fort McHenry leads to the writing of the Star-Spangled Banner. So let's take a look what happens at Fort McHenry, which, as I said, is in Baltimore. Fort McHenry protects the entrance to Baltimore. So that means that any ships that are going to sail into the city of Baltimore need to go past Fort McHenry. Um, fort McHenry is a star-shaped fort, which is common for the time. And there are people who live in the city of Baltimore. And the merchants in the city of Baltimore, the business owners, decide that they need to protect their city. They know that the British are going to come because this is where a lot of the privateers sail from. So knowing that the British will come, the merchants decide that they are going to protect their city by sinking their own ships. By sinking their own ships outside of Fort McHenry, that is going to create a man-made reef on the bottom. When these ships begin to pile up on the bottom of, or just outside of Fort McHenry, it basically makes sure that the British ships cannot get too close to the city of Baltimore without risking doing damage to their own ships. Preparing for the battle that is going to happen, the United States, the citizens of Baltimore specifically, will request that a huge American flag is made. This fat flag is going to be 30 feet tall and 42 feet wide. The reason why the American flag is made to be so large is so that the British will easily be able to see the flag. It's kind of like throwing it in their faces that this is United States land, you are coming on to or trying to attack United States for it, and we are going to fight you for it. The British ships arrive outside uh, Fort McHenry and finally do begin bombing Fort McHenry. The British will bomb the fort for 25 hours. And for 25 hours, people just hear the bombing and they wait to see, will the Americans be able to actually stop the British from taking over Fort McHenry. When the bombing stops at 4.30 in the morning, no one really knows what that means. When the bombing stops, it might mean that the British have given up and the Americans have won. Or the bombing may have stopped because the British have won and they don't need to bomb Fort McHenry anymore. Nobody knows who has won. And Francis Scott Key is one of those people who is waiting to see who exactly won. When the sun finally begins to rise, because it's 4.30 in the morning when the bombing start, stops. So at 4.30 in the morning, it's too dark for anyone to see. And the way that Francis Scott Key and everyone else will know who won the Battle of Fort McHenry is by looking to see which flag is outside of Fort McHenry. When the sun finally rises, they do begin to see that the American flag is there. That is what inspires Francis Scott Key to write a poem that becomes known as the Star-Spangled Banner. So how exactly did Francis Scott Key end up in this, uh, in this position? He was born into a fairly wealthy family, and he was at the Battle of Bladensburg, which you should remember is when the Americans try to stop the British from taking over at Washington, D.C., and it failed miserably. A friend of Francis Scott Key's family was taken as a prisoner at the Battle of Bladensburg. Francis Scott Key goes to the British and tries to talk them into releasing Dr. Beans. He does do that. However, the two men are then told that they have to remain on board a British ship until after the attack on Baltimore is completed. So they're in the harbor. They're watching the British bomb Fort McHenry and they can see the fort in the distance, they can see the ramparts, which are the walls from their position, but they don't know who is actually won who has won. So when the bombing stops around 4, 4.30 in the morning, the question is, who won? When he finally sees the American flag, he knows that the bombing stopped because the British have lost this battle. And that is when he decides to write a poem. The first verse of that poem, or the first stanza, is what we sing as our national anthem. If you think about it, he's really just describing that time where he's trying to find out, can you see the flag? This is what the national anthem is about. Saying, oh say can you see by the dawn's early light, 
Because remember, it's 4, 4.30 in the morning. As the sun is just coming up, it's just dawn. Can you see with this very little bit of light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? The last time we saw this flag was at twilight, which means sunset. So that's the last time we saw it. Is it still there? We could see whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. Perilous meaning dangerous. So throughout that dangerous fight, I could see the broad, st broad stripes. I could see the bright stars over the ramparts because the flag was inside these defensive walls, which we call ramparts. So I could look over the ramparts, those walls, and see the flag gallantly streaming. And throughout the night, I heard the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air. So hearing that throughout the night, that gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Because as soon as the British have taken down that flag, that means the battle is over. So as long as the British are still fighting, the British have not won yet. And then the last part we sing is just him asking, does that star-spangled banner yet wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave? When we sing the national anthem, we're still asking the question, does he see the flag? And as of right now, the answer is no. It's actually in stanza two when he does see the flag. He mentions finally, now it catches the gleam of the morning's first beam in full glory reflected now shines in the stream. Tis the star spangled banner along may it wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. That flag has still been kept by the United States. It is kept at the Smithsonian, which is a series of uh, museums down in Washington, DC. And here you're looking at some of the people who go through the process of trying to keep the flag clean. Here you can see the size of the flag just um, with looking at people as sort of your baseline. The flag is obviously a lot smaller than it once was because people very early on began taking pieces of the flag, realizing that it would be a piece of history. This is considered an American victory because we stopped the British from invading at Baltimore. Another major American victory is going to happen with the Battle of New Orleans. Now, all three of these events happen in a relatively short amount of time. So let's see what's going on at the end of the war. Uh, the armistice is the peace signing, the end of hostilities. That's going to come in 1814. Unfortunately, nobody in the United States knows that the war has actually ended, which is why the greatest victory for the United States actually comes after the peace treaty has been signed, and that happens at the Battle of New Orleans, which is fought in January of 1815. Andrew Jackson who has the nickname of Old Hickory. Hickory is a very hard wood, and Andrew Jackson was known as a very tough person. And so Andrew Jackson, nicknamed Old Hickory, is going to organize the defense of New Orleans. To organize the people who will defend the city of New Orleans, which is the economic heart of the United States, he is going to get together pirates, smugglers, free black men, militias, Native Americans, people from the military, regular people from New Orleans. It is really a rather impressive crew that he pulls together to plan for the defense of New Orleans. He knows that the British will try to take over the city because of how important it is to the economy of the United States. And he is absolutely right. Um, when the British finally do invade, Andrew Jackson has them climb over a series of these earthen walls that his crew has assembled at the entrance to New Orleans, and it really just makes it far too difficult for the British to successfully invade. The British are going to abandon trying to take over New Orleans. The result is a huge American victory. As far as casualties, casualties meaning people who are dead, wounded, or missing, the British have over 2,000 casualties in less than an hour of fighting against Andrew Jackson and the American forces. The Americans have 71. So clearly, this is a major American victory. The problem, as I said, is that the war was actually over. It's just that nobody knew it yet. So let's take a look at 
how the war ends. How does it change things for the United States? The effects of the War of 1812. The Treaty of Ghent is signed in Belgium. So the war is being, the end of the war is being negotiated in the European country of Belgium. And it's going to be signed in December of 1814. But like I said, with no instant communication, nobody knew that the war had ended. As far as boundaries, boundaries do not change. The people who had certain pieces of land before the war will have the same pieces of land after the war. No boundaries change. The U.S. does not gain any land. Another effect, Andrew Jackson is going to become this national hero. And with all of the founders either, you know, dying or getting to an age or getting to a point where they're stepping out of public life, we kind of need that new national hero. Andrew Jackson is going to become that for the United States. The status of the United States is going to be raised in the eyes of Europe. The United States seems like that stronger, tougher country that we wanted to be so badly because we have defended ourselves against Britain. And this time we did it without any help from anybody at all. We stood our ground on our own. So the status of the United States is raised in the eyes of Europe. Lastly, the United States and Britain, they start to become friends. This is the start of a much friendlier relationship between the United States and Britain. The last effect is going to be the death of the Federalist Party. The Federalists never supported the War of 1812. They were the isolationists, they were the doves, they were the people who said, this is going to destroy our entire economy, which was an exaggeration, but it was something that they talked about frequently. So there ends up being a meeting of Federalists in Hartford, Connecticut, and they discuss one major thing, and that is how to deal with the Virginia dynasty. They want to make an amendment to the Constitution that would not allow two presidents in a row from the same state. So that whole Virginia dynasty, they're trying to break up by changing the Constitution. No two presidents can be from the same state in a row. And they say that if Congress will not make this change, then perhaps the next thing they discuss is maybe the northern states will go and make their own country. Maybe they don't need to be part of the United States. They leave this meeting and they decide that they need to go down to Washington, D.C. and present these ideas to Congress. And so they do. They're ready to make their demands about the change for the Constitution and possibly declaring independence from the United States and making their own northern nation. But everyone has just learned of the war coming to an end. So people are happy and they look at the Federalists like, why would you want to leave this country? Look at what we just did. We just defended ourselves against England. That's amazing. The appearance is that the Federalists are unpatriotic, which is something politicians cannot be. You cannot be unpatriotic. As a result, fewer and fewer people are going to join the Federalist political party and the Federalists will die out. And that is how the United States does not lose the War of 1812.